Pete Evans. We're live, buddy. Hey. Welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me. Where did it all start, man? Like <laughs> everyone knows the the whole Evans Hugo story. Like how do you go from having these iconic venues, Bondi, the cross in particular, and then subsequently Manly to being the wellness paleo warrior? Well, you'd have to go back to the start actually, but <laughs> of my existence. So it has been a um, a wonderful journey and it keeps getting better every, each and every minute that I am alive in this experience and um, I'm very grateful for choosing these paths mm. that had been presented to me and following my intuition. I mean, basically the food side of my journey came about really as a avenue to get out of home, to be independent. To grow up here, Sydney? No, I grew up in Melbourne and also on the Gold Coast. Okay, beautiful. And at the age of 17, I felt like I needed to spread my wings yeah. and leave the nest, so to speak. Who was in the nest outside your mum and dad? Just yep. mum. Yep, just your mum. Yeah, and we had, we've got a wonderful relationship we always have. But at that point in time, I was like, okay, well, I didn't love school. Yeah. I didn't feel like it benefited me. I felt like that it was a waste of my time. Yeah, get it. So the the outcome of that was how do I find myself? How do I actually understand who I am, what I want to be? And You were asking that question at 17? Oh, fuck yeah. Wow. I think everybody does. I think everybody is asking that question their whole throughout, life. throughout their whole yeah, existence. Yeah, no, I get it. But for some, it's not so obvious. I think that the feeling of being a little bit lost at 17 is prevalent, but the... I think the, being the, lost the, all your life the is more, pretty The more Buddha approach of finding yourself seems to be less or certainly less spoken about. Yeah. So part of that journey was actually getting out of my comfort zone and the tools to do that for me was to get a trade. Yeah. And I looked at cooking. I looked at being a butcher. I mm. looked at being a hairdresser, a plumber, electrician, a builder, you name it. Basically any trade that was available to me. And I didn't want to go to school. Yeah. Like I, I, Smart decision. I just, school was just a, a, a soul destroying place f for somebody like myself. Mm. A lot of people, I dare say. So. I weighed up all the different opportunities in front of me and I thought, well, what's the one that will actually benefit me as a tool? Cooking one hands down. Mm. Like I really did out of all of them and I had no passion for any of them. Yeah, not you know? even cooking. No, I was, no. Just, like, I was, just I was curious kid. to see how I could live in the world yeah. and make my own way. And I knew if, to, for that I needed a job. Mm. I needed some sort of path. And cooking just ticked the boxes. I thought, oh, well, if I learn how to cook, at least that is a life skill that I currently don't have. Yeah. Even though I'd worked in fast food restaurants for the three years prior from the, pretty much the age of 13, um, it still wasn't a skill that I could appreciate. Yeah. Was your mum a good cook? Yeah, she's a great cook. Yeah. Yeah. You have to say that. Just no, she was. She, she, she listens to this. No, she was a fantastic cook. She still <laughs> is. You know, I still love eating her food to this day. You know, she's she's nudging eighty now, and uh, my kids love her food, and she's she's a great grandmother, and yeah, amazing, and uh, very inspiring. So that led me into the world of cooking professionally, and what a world that is! Mm, it oh, is. Fuck. Where did it all start? Fuck me! Did you go and find <laughs> someone, or you just jumped in? No, I got an apprenticeship and started at TAFE and. I worked in a seafood restaurant on the Gold Coast and I started working 60 hours a week. And then I supplemented that with a second job as a waiter. So That's I was working 80-hour 80 hours, 80 hour weeks pretty much from the time I left school because I wanted to live out of home. And I remember I shared a room on a beachside place. It cost me $27.50 per week. On I the shared, Gold Coast? Yep. Yeah. Surface paradise. And uh, I shared a room with a fellow that actually um, had a restaurant and from there, it just opened up a whole new world. Yeah, a whole new, a whole new experience. And I worked for a year and a half on the Gold Coast, and then I moved to Melbourne. Yeah, because I found that um, at the time Melbourne was the culinary capital of Australia. And if I'm going to do this, let's do this properly. Mm. And after a year or so of being on the Gold Coast, dealing with people that weren't in it for the passion, 
I wouldn't say they were artists of the craft. Yeah. I wouldn't say they had a deep burning desire to teach the juniors that were coming through like myself. Mm. It felt like a, uh, a, a very hierarchical institution of um, male-dominated egotistical behaviour mm. that was fed from the top down. Yeah. And if you're at the bottom, you cop to all the shit. Yeah, there's still an element of that. I think it's it's certainly gotten better, but without doubt there are elements of it still in the industry. Yeah, and that, you know, all through this journey, you always learn from all experiences. Mm, of course. Whether they're painful, whether they're traumatic, mm. whether they're joyous, whether whatever it is, you know, it's an opportunity to grow. And that was probably one of my greatest lessons in that first year and a half because it taught me who I didn't want to become. Who didn't you want to become? Like those people. Yeah, the that egotistical, hierarchical, unpassionate. Bullies. Bullies, yeah. Physical, mental. Yeah. That yeah. Type, type of abuse on a daily basis, you yeah. know, relentless. Mm. Um, so I'm grateful for that experience. It was challenging at the time. Yeah. Especially combine that with the extreme workload that entails when you're a first year apprentice yeah it's not pretty that's for sure um but it's definitely and this is why i love this industry so much is there's a camaraderie now and there possibly always has been but there's a there's a i have a deep level of respect for anybody in this industry mm. that has journeyed through those times yeah that depth of despair frustration mm. pain um, wanting to give it all away, wanting to run away, yeah. facing your fears, facing mm. the bullies, facing whatever it is. Yeah. And what it taught me about myself was that I could face any, any fear in my life. Mm. I felt like that nothing will ever compare to some of the points of my journey as far as really being a struggle for me. Yeah. So now I feel... I won't say bulletproof, but nothing seems impossible yeah. after those experiences on my journey I get as it. being a chef. So that led me to, if ever I got into a position of authority, I would train and teach with love and communication and respect and understanding that we're all on a different path and a different journey and we all learn differently. Mm. You know, some are fantastic at... at retaining information some need to learn by feel and touch some need to hear it some need to visualize it yeah and we're all different and that's what makes i guess working in a team in a kitchen so so beautiful because we all have our strengths and our weaknesses and when you can combine a group of individuals with those different strengths and weaknesses and create something memorable mm for a customer or for yourself or for that team that is greater than an individual, that's when the magic happens. Yeah. And any chef or restaurateur or anyone in business that is listening to this can probably relate to those those magical moments or those unions of people where everything's in flow. Mm. And I was listening to a podcast today about the flow state and it, and it happens in a lot of people's uh, relationships with a sport or a passion that they do. Yeah, and well, surfing's the classic, isn't it? We were talking about that before where... But it also happens... In the kitchen or In the kitchen. Yeah. You know, it does. I, th I think back to the 20-odd years that I was in those kitchens working 80 to 100-hour weeks, and a lot of that time would have been in perfect flow, mm. perfect harmony, perfect unison with a team or even individually mm. to create these memorable moments. And being a chef is... is as I always taught my <clears throat> my staff or my colleagues, it didn't matter whether we were cooking a piece of toast or uh, serving one of the best pieces of meat or seafood in the world. You had to give it exactly the same amount of respect and attention. Yeah. No matter what time of the day it was, whether it was breakfast <laughs> and you're doing a poached egg or whether it was dinner time and you're yeah. serving foie gras, you know, to have that intention that every time you serve something you're striving for perfection mm. that is that was always my intention whenever i was in the kitchen did you get that from 
another chef teaching you? Did you get that from some spiritual practice you were doing? Because it kind of feels like you've you've found that from someone else as opposed to someone in the kitchen. I think it's a combination of all the experiences, all my mentors, all my teachers, all the people that taught me the right way and the wrong way. You know, you 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 develop your own identity and, and understanding the world by witnessing how other people are mm. in that space as well. Sure. So as you know when i really wanted to express myself as a chef yeah i made the decision to learn from the greats and including to learn. who were some of the big ones that influenced you well i spent about 5 years attending every single cooking class that i could and i take my staff with me at the time and this is when i moved to sydney and at the time, people like Tetsuya, yeah. David Thompson, Christine Manfield, Neil Perry, yeah. um, Greg Maloof, uh, you, you, Kylie Kwong, you name any famous Australian chef or overseas chef that visited. I made it my, my mission to sit in their presence. Love it. And be a sponge. Yeah. I wanted to – and the sponge – aspect or my intention was to understand why these people love cooking yeah i couldn't give a fuck how they cooked you yeah, know as far it. as how to cook a piece of meat you was know was there a common thread pete that you found with all of them at why they loved cooking no, or was it different throughout each and everyone was different which is what i love yeah. you know and i i tended to you know without diminishing what it was but i i, I seem to take from all aspects of how they taught, why mm. they taught, the language that they used. Did they talk about it from the heart or were they talking about it from the head? Mm. You know, was there a combination of that? Was there that that magic factor yeah. to why these people treated food with such reverence and why they were at that level of the game? You know, life is a game and it's we, we all play it yeah. with our own set of rules. For sure. And I love studying from the experts. And I've been doing that now for 20, 25 years in all manner of, of my enterprises, yeah. whether it's cooking, whether it's health, whether it's uh, the media, yeah, whether it. it's writing, you know, and, and all of these things have really challenged me. Yeah. And each one of them is an opportunity for me to grow, especially if I have fear. Mm. So for many years, I, I didn't think I could create food. I was fantastic at copying people. Yeah. Like, and if I copied somebody, I would make it my goal to make it better <laughs> than what they did. But that's what most people in the world do. There's like one inventor and everyone else continues to improve on it. And I did that for years and I was like, okay, I can do that. But what's my greatest fear? My greatest fear is showing my own creativity. creativity. Yeah. So I spend years pushing myself in my own kitchen, in my own way, to create, to create, to create, to create, to come up with new ideas. Got it. When was your first restaurant you did yourself? Uh, 19. 19? Which, 19. What was it called? We, my brother and his best friend Daniel opened a restaurant called The Pantry in Melbourne. Okay. Pantry uh, is a cafe slash restaurant. And I was working as a third year apprentice at the time in Melbourne at a, at a great little Italian restaurant called The Continental Cafe, which had a jazz club upstairs. And I used to run the jazz club in my third year as, as the main chef up there. And at the time, I was working 80 hour weeks as well. I'd work, I'd made sure I worked longer and harder than anybody else on the team. Yeah. It that works, man. Pretty it, proven formula most of the time. Yeah. But it's funny, you know, I look back now and I think, you know, there's this common thread that's, that we promote in Australia and elsewhere that you got to work hard to succeed. I'm really trying to, to challenge that mm. because I, I have a funny relationship with work. I, I I think it's a it's an unnatural thing to do in the in the amount of and the amount of time that we spend doing it. Yeah. It it creates it can create a lot of ill health for us and, and disconnect us from our true purpose. Yeah. So unless that work is your true purpose. 
Yeah, but then a lot of can you can get lost in the work. Sure. You know, you can find an imbalance in there. And so many of these masters of their craft. Quite lost in it. They are artists. Yeah. And they are obsessed by their craft. Yep. And I definitely witnessed that in mm. so many in so many different areas. Yeah. And I'm very cautious that that is also not a trap for me. And don't worry, I've I've been a workaholic and I've no I, longer. Um, I don't see what I do anymore as work. But isn't that it though? <laughs> like that that's that's no different to what Neil or Kylie or one of those people would have said that yeah. this isn't work for me. Like they're in that flow state. So long as and the only caveat I will say to that, so long as one's health and spirituality and relationships are intact, because I don't think anything if you lose those three things can compensate for the loss. Well, I think it, it comes down to expression of self that is in balance with that forward momentum of, of, of our existence. And we know when we're out of balance. We know when we're, when we're allocating too much time to certain things in life, you know. And it could be being lazy. It could be overtraining. It could be overworking. It could be not doing nothing. Yeah. You know, there's this... We know intuitively when we're out of balance. Mm. And I've been out of balance in all aspects of my life. And, and I'm continually tweaking that spectrum. I mean, I was just on, on the road for three weeks filming a new documentary. And I would say I was out of balance in, in part of that experience. Sleep or just in terms of the amount of work? The amount of work and the amount of... Um, unrest that I had in that experience but at the same time I was I was also in a flow of something yeah. that was that was calling for me to mm. follow so so now when I get back it's like okay get back into some sort of routine with to rebalance so yeah. that when the next opportunity to, to grow and to do something like that appears I have the strength and vitality and the clarity to to really Focus in on that time and 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 basically strike, and yes. get in and get out. Are you on your own, or do you take Nicola with you when you travel? Uh, generally on my own. On so your own. Nick is my wife, and yeah. we've got a farm, and uh, she stays and manages the farm. Yeah. So I and my kids live in Sydney as well. So it's this it's this continual balancing act of so many different aspects, whether it's husband, father, um, spiritual. Um, seeker, yeah, truth seeker. Mm. Um, Have you found the truth yet? <laughs> I, I, I constantly ask myself each and every day, what have I learnt today, and is that the truth? Yeah. You what know? do you learn today? Well, today I I've... to bring your board with you when you drive down from <laughs> the Gold Coast. Yeah, we we drove down. We spent four hours in a car today and listening to a podcast actually. So. Um, uh, a wonderful gentleman called Paul Check, and if you've never heard of Paul Check before, C H E K, check him out. He actually <laughs> did an interview, a podcast, two and a half hour podcast with my film director that I'm working on this latest film with. Uh, is he the guy out of the fitness industry? No, no. So, oh, Paul Check is. Paul, Paul Check. Well, yeah. we have to be careful when we identify and put labels on people. Oh, yeah, so yeah. you may say Correct that Paul it. Check is has a has an identity in the fitness industry created aerobics and stuff like that was that him he functional movement functional and, movement and, and yeah okay the Czech institute and that's it he doesn't like being associated with that i don't know you'd you have to know. ask him okay. that but he is we all are more than our labels yeah and our vocations mm, that's and I, the shit out of people and i think that is I always bring it back to if someone says you were this, you were that, I go, well, I'm a human being. Mm. I'm actually a, a, a spiritual being having a human experience in mm. this in this reality right now. Mm. You know? Possibly I'm having another one somewhere else or at the same yeah. time. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, how do you know? This isn't a dream. Well, that's an interesting concept because I, I – we have this thing called the paradox, the Tao paradox, where two things can be true at the same time mm. that are complete opposites. And 
Interestingly enough, I like the mood lighting that you've said here. Yeah, no, we do that, man. You know, it's just to make sure you're awake. But (laughs) with my own work with plant medicines and other uh, types of earth medicines out there, you can actually have an experience where this waking reality that we are experiencing right now does feel like the dream. Mm. And the ultimate truth is that there is only one Mm. experience that is happening to all of us and Mm. we're all interconnected and I have witnessed that. So, yes, this is the dream, but it is also the reality. Mm. So that's the paradox. And how do you play this game of reality without getting caught up in it and without burning out and to actually appreciate this gift of this this experience? Yeah. What and advice do you give to people on that, Pete? M- well, I try not to give advice to people. Yeah. You know, if somebody well, asks me- perspective? If Put it in a, a, a better way of putting it. Because uh, you're, you're right, like giving people advice never works, but clearly you're- uh, well, I'll tell you my perspective. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm asking for. Yeah. Yep. So, from my understanding and my perception is we have one go at life here. Maybe not. As this identity. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know? yep. Okay. I'm with okay. you. Yeah. In this body, in this time frame. So, what are you going to do with that experience? What are you going to do with that gift that they call the present? Mm-hmm. You know, and- it, I don't mind what anybody does, you know. Mm. I'm not here to judge anybody or to to encourage anybody to do anything other than be themselves. Mm. We're all we're all individuated part of one consciousness. We're all having this unique from what we generally think is a unique individual experience. Yeah. And my interpretation of that and what I would like to do with this experience is to be around for as long as possible Mm. and just watch it unfold. Can I contribute in a meaningful way to that experience for Mm. myself? Yes. Can I contribute to the experience that others are having at the same time? Possibly, but I have no expectations on that. Does my work inspire me? And we could call it work. It does. It Can does. it inspire others? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think it does. But I, again, I have no expectations on what other people sure. gain from my words or what I share with the world, whether it be through books, whether it be through documentaries, whether it be through TV, whether it be through silence, yeah. whether it be through social media, whether it be through me being a parent to my children, whether me being a lover to my, to my wife. How old are your kids now? 12 and 14. Yeah, there'd be a handful. No, no, not at all. No, no, they're they're really? also uh, they're saints. It's it's interesting, and I have to, you know, our perception of like what you just said that kids can be a handful. You know, that's that's the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. That's if if you have children and you are not prepared to take on every single experience that that entails, then buckle up Mm. and be open to it because they can give us the best opportunities for our our own spiritual growth Mm. and our own emotional growth. You know, when a child comes into the world, their default position or being is unconditional love. Yeah. And unconditional love means loving without conditions. And if we can remember that is our only purpose here on this planet, is to remember that we are beings of unconditional love. Mm. And we live and build these patterns of identity that rem- that keep us further and further away from our default being. Mm. And this is where things such as plant medicines, meditation, breathing techniques, Mm. doing the things that you love, Mm. creating food or or serving food to yourself or to others, riding a wave and feeling time stand still, in those moments 
looking into your children's eyes or your lover's eyes or breathing in unison as you're making love, you know, and, and letting go of all fear. Those are the moments that we connect back and remember our default setting, which mm. is unconditional love, trust, acceptance. So kids, handful, what other way would you want them to be? I get it. You know, and and I don't see my kids as a handful. I see them as a as a tool, as a not a tool, but each and every day that I look into their eyes, I remember parts of that me that is unconditional love. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's 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 a gift and it's a joy to be a father. It's it's a joy to be a human being on this planet, even if it is seems like it's doom and gloom. There is a lot of doom and gloom, and you <laughs> but there's also a lot, there's of, a lot love of beautiful and light. things. I know there, and we live in the the safest times that they've ever been in the history of man, and the media beats up a lot of different things. And I, I, I absolutely agree with you. There's a lot to be thankful for, but there's also a lot of challenges. There's a lot of health challenges. Interested in what you were talking about with plant based medicine because we chatted a little bit about it offline about psychedelics whether it is psilocybin or thc or some of the more exotic ayahuasca etc mm -hmm. what's your understanding of it pete like sure have, have you, I'm, I'm assuming you've got a deep knowledge of it from what i know of you well a connection to nature is probably the one thing that we all could use a big dose of reconnection to nature. Mm. Now, that means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And no one will have the same path as me. No one will have the same path as you. Yeah. You know, reconnection to nature could be as simple as someone starting a garden in their backyard. Yeah. And how profound can that be? That can bring a, a sense of watching and creating life, watching it grow, then nourishing ourselves. And then that whole cycle, and, and that can bring about Patience, respect, understanding, love. Mm. Love of self is what we all, you know, uh, are striving for. Mm. And I see connection to nature as one of the best ways that we can love ourselves. Mm. It's the simplest way. Somebody else, it could be just walking along the beach with their shoes off yep. every morning. That could be their spiritual practice. Yeah. They could set an intention in the morning. I'm going to walk every day when I can, get my feet in the water and spend 20 minutes just by myself or with my loved one or with a pet. And I'll set an intention mm. that today I'm going to grow in one way or another. Mm. And that could be challenging. It could be liberating. It could be joyous. It could be painful. It could be anything. Yeah. So... A reconnection to nature is, is vitally important, I think, at this particular stage of our existence because there seems to be a huge disconnect. And we see that in the media. We see it in what's available for us to eat. Yeah. We see it in what's available for us. You know, once upon a time, we would sit around and tell stories around a fire yeah. outside sharing beautiful food that was all organic, mm. sharing stories, communicating and communing as human beings need to do. Yep. These days, I mean, I'm going to generalise here, but we seem to sleep off the ground. Yeah. We have rubber between us and that's cool because it's comfortable. Yeah. But if you think about it, then we leave the house. We generally put on shoes. I actually put on shoes because I know the butcher shop here. So I thought I better not walk in with you bare, can feet. Come bare feet, man. But um, so many of us spend the whole day disconnected to the earth with a piece of rubber between us on our feet, and then yeah. we sleep off the earth. And that's just that's just a disconnection to the actual energy of the planet and they might seem woo woo to you yeah that's all right. but if you think about when you go on holidays and one of the reasons that people feel great is usually because they've taken their shoes off and they're walking on the beach or lying on the park or, yeah. or connecting to nature a holiday is generally connecting back to nature mm. so it's not really usually it's about the time off work it's about reconnection to nature that's why people go to tropical islands or into the bush or go skiing or whatever it may be 
So I'm going to get to the plant medicine in a minute, but a reconnection to nature is vitally important for us at this particular time because then we get home and a lot of people go to work and they're under artificial lights. Yeah. And they go home and they look at artificial light through a screen. Yeah. Some people heat up their food with artificial technology, like <laughs> microwave. Yeah. And they're eating food that is not natural. Mm. So we have this huge disconnect from who we are as human beings. So I always bring it back to, if we're a human being, what are the foods that really help us thrive? What are the ways in which we should be sleeping which help us thrive? What are the ways in which we can breathe and which can help us thrive and connect? Yeah. What are the ways we can c communicate with one another and ourselves, whether it be a, a spiritual practice or whether it's just connection to another human being, which is another version of ourselves, yeah. Yeah. if we look at it on a, on a large, deep scale, that's reconnection to nature. How do we connect back to the sun, for instance, because most of us hardly see it. And if we do, we usually overdose on it. Mm, get some burn and yeah. <sighs> you know, it's well, like we'll, we'll make up for the all the week that we haven't been in the sun or the last six months that we haven't been in the sun and we'll just lie there me. in the middle of the day. You know? Yeah. And then we wonder why we have... Vitamin D deficiency. Well, that and the yeah. rate of skin cancers and oh, other, yeah, other issues. Yeah, because we do not have that healthy relationship with something that we used to yeah. intuitively Get know it. how to respect and communicate with. Mm. Our bodies know how to communicate with the sun. Yeah. They really do. No, I mean, it. if you think about how vitamin D actually works, it's a communication system mm -hmm. between us and that ball of fire. Mm. <laughs> And uh, it's interesting because all religions were based on our relationship with the sun and now we live in a society that fears it. Yeah, they fear it. We put sunscreens on and I know you get a lot of stick from <laughs> different people around <laughs> telling others that, that wearing sunscreen. And I get it, you know, like I get it if I'm in the middle of the Mentawis, in the middle of the day I'm wearing sunscreen because I'm a pasty white guy. Yeah. But if I go for a surf at six o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And that's back to your point about intuition. So then coming back into being human. So we have these tools on the planet. It's like a, a virtual reality video game. You know, some video games have these, these hidden messages there mm. or hidden things that once you get through one level, you, you can access that prize. Yeah. You know, for some reason on this planet, there are certain plants and certain animals that when we communicate with them and have a connection with them, they give us an opportunity to learn more about ourselves in ways that it's a tool for self-discovery. Yeah. Now, my perception or intuition or understanding of that is that it's not random. You know, I'm doing a documentary at the moment and looking at probably... It's a psychedelic, but probably the least known psychedelic, but the most popular psychedelic is cannabis. Yeah. You know, some people call it marijuana and it's got THC in it. But it's only psychedelic if you eat it, yeah? Um, it No, it depends on how you do it. So we were just filming with um, two different practitioners and uh, one, different cl one clinic and one solo practitioner that does cannabis-assisted psychotherapy. They also yeah. use psilocybin or sometimes MDMA as well. And they say that generally a psychotherapy session, talk session with any therapist has yep. a 5% success rate. Right. Pretty low. Pretty low. You wouldn't put that bet on? No. No. Uh -huh. But um, on top of that, if you do it with cannabis or other plant medicines, you can have an 85 to 90% success rate, sustainable success rate of understanding self and releasing those blocked patterns of identity mm -hmm. that I was talking about earlier. So, so why do these plants exist or why do these animals exist that give us, that are tools for us for a greater understanding of self? Yeah. That's, that's a very, <sighs> I think it's a question that people have been pondering for, for millennia because these, Plants have been used for, for yeah. millennia yeah. for greater understanding of self. 
And it's interesting because I interviewed a couple of historians and they believe that most religions have used some sort of plant medicine in their in their existence, mm. which is where some of these fa- fables and mythologies and and understandings have occurred about who we are and and the reality of this existence. So they offer us as a, a tool, and I'm not going to say that they're for everybody. You yeah. know, I cannot say that because, like everything, everybody is on their own journey. Yeah, um, everything needs. They're very powerful tools. Mm. Um, so they need to be um, very well um, researched, yeah. And and I would never recommend it for anybody. Mm. You know, it has to be a personal exploration if that is something that calls for people to to explore. And if you are, then <clears throat> I would suggest that you do it in the presence of somebody that has been doing it for a very long period time. of time. Yeah, that is well respected in that community. Yeah, that is seems to be a practitioner for for the right reasons. Yeah, you know. But why in a society where you can walk five minutes down the road and buy a beer or fifteen beers, and mm-hmm. we're not worried about that? Why are you so concerned about someone taking a, a natural? What is at the end of the day a, a natural medicine? I have concern over alcohol more so than any other. That's my point, though. Yeah, but I would never recommend anyone to drink alcohol. Yeah. You know, I would, you, I'd say the pen? same thing very rarely. Yeah. Very rarely. What I, about in the heyday when you were a young buck I, chefing? Did you party like a bandit? I was an alcoholic drug addict. You yeah. Know? I did it all. Yeah. I've experienced it all. Mm. I've, I've, and even over the last years when I've, um, you know, experienced different psychedelic medicines. You know, and I use that word medicine. And I'd never probably use that <laughs> to term uh, to define alcohol. You know, but um, these plant medicines are powerful tools. Mm. And like any me- medicine, it depends on the dosage. Yeah, it but food, de- food, the same thing applies. Surely, food is medicine, yeah. and a reconnection back to nature mm. to really focus on where your food comes from. Yeah. Whether it be if you're buying a a piece of meat from the butcher. Yeah. You know? My question is, has it been grass fed, grass finished? Mm. Simple. If I'm eating an organic chicken, which I don't eat too many of them, what where has that has it been grown and you know? what's it been fed and the grass fed grain fed thing mm-hmm. super important point and one that i think is misunderstood i think is shrouded in a little bit of mystique in your professional opinion mm-hmm. the health benefits of grass fed over grain fed 1000% based on based on the omega 6 ratio that happens when a cow consumes more grain than grass so the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio changes when it's grain fed yeah yeah so if we look here's the thing (laughs) if we look to nature nature has it worked out if you think about the role of a herbivore Mm -hmm. is to eat the grass shit (laughs) reproduce yeah move on yeah just keep going, become food for larger pred- or predators. You know, it's, it's a. If we look at the profile of the meat and wild seafood, for instance, and, you know, if I could choose a few different meats that I would suggest that we really focus on and, and that are the healthiest, it would be grass fed, grass finished yeah. herbivores. Yes. Such as. Cattle, lamb, or sheep, yeah. especially game animals, are, sp- are fantastic. Kangaroo, we've been trying to get people onto that program forever, and we will continue. And wild seafood, yeah, sustainable, smaller wild seafood that that can replenish itself. You know, so why do I say that? Is because even if you look at organic chickens or organic pork and how that is being fed these days. It's good, 
but does it mimic what it would normally do in nature, mm. in the ratios that it would? Insofar as the food it's eating yeah. and how it's moving? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you take a cow, for instance, it's probably eating the same thing it was a 1,000 years, years ago, ago. 2,000 years ago, if it's being raised on grass and finished on grass. If we look at wild seafood, they're eating smaller seafood or whatever it is, the krill or whatever it may be, depending mm. on the species of fish. And that hasn't changed over however long that has been happening. So the nutritional profile of these animals are identical pretty much. I mean, there's been some sort of um, genetic changes in some of the land-based animals, obviously, and they've been bred differently than the wild cattle that it came from originally. Yeah, of course. But in its essence, they are probably, out of all the foods on the planet, they are the closest to being the perfect version of itself. Yeah. Even if when you look at vegetables these days and how hybridized they are and how we've cultivated them, you know, very different than what was wild and we could forage for of course. prior. Yeah. So I stick most of my health on making sure that I eat really well sourced red meat yeah. and game and beautiful seafood. I mean, I eat farm seafood like oysters yeah. or mussels, yeah. again, because they are farmed in a way that it's just nutrients going through the water. So, And they're very sustainable from, from my observations and understanding. So I base my diet around those principles and then I supplement with some chicken or some meat, I mean some pork yeah. or some bacon just for, or some eggs. For, for variety or just yeah, because variety. Got, yeah. And generally I eat nose to tail as much as possible with a, yeah. with a large emphasis on organ meats. Yeah. So at the and fattier that's driven, cuts, that's driven by obviously the organ meats nutritionally and things. But is it a respect to the animal too, the nose to tail? Yeah, it is. But also from a selfish point of view, nothing compares to organ meats as far as health and nutrition health, goes. Yeah, nothing course. on the planet. There, is, I said it the other day. There is no plant on the planet that can compete with red meat or seafood in the nutritional stakes. Yeah. If you as a human want to live for as long as possible. On this planet, mm. I would be doubling down on good quality meat and good quality seafood, and especially including some sort of offal from both species, from from land and sea animals, into your diet, and then using vegetables and fruit and as a supplementation. Mm. But what do you think then, Pete, of these? hysterical and in my eyes and this is just my humble opinion the very misrepresented documentaries like what the health that came out a mm -hmm. couple of years ago yeah. that i don't know a friend that hasn't at some point that's watched <laughs> that documentary gone and become a vegan and i just have to to your point of never giving someone advice and it's and it's not conflicted because you know, we have a big meat wholesaling business, but I say, really, you've got to scratch a little deeper than an hour and a half documentary. Yeah. From a health perspective, I'd love your view on why it really is so difficult as a, ve as a vegan in particular, but even as a vegetarian to get all the macro and micronutrients you need to, to live at optimal health. Well, it's just biology. It's evolution. It's, yeah. it's they have to supplement. As soon as you have to supplement, you know that there's something wrong. But even if they supplement, the bioavailability of supplements and what we actually get into our system, like the science is there and yet there seems to be so much and an ever-increasing building support of people that are becoming vegan and vegetarian. I think it's fantastic. And the reason I think it's fantastic is because so many of my mentors and even myself, I was a vegan from the age of 19 to 22, mm. four years. This is going back a long time. Yeah. I did an Anthony Robbins course and he was promoting vegetarianism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was promoting that, um, what was it called? Fit for life too. Yeah, fit for just, life. Just fruit. So um, I ventured down that path mm. and I thought I was doing the right thing Yeah, by the planet, by the animals, by myself. And it I held on to that belief for so long yeah. until my body said, what the fuck are you doing, mate? Got sick. You are getting sicker and sicker. Mm. And 
Why? I know that Why I, were you getting sick though? Like from a nutritional perspective, oh, what you. weren't you getting? Vitamin B12, vitamin D. Yeah, I was wasting iron, away. Calcium. Everything. Yeah. Were well, you a skinny guy anyway, so. But, um, so I was lacking in proper nutrition, mental and physical and even spiritual, mm. you know. And the further we get away from, I mean, you look at the definition of what a human being is and we're omnivores, mm. you know. We can survive on a plant-based diet. And if that is your prerogative and that is how you feel, then then go for it. I'm, I'm, Nowhere I'm, in history have we, though. That's a thing. Mm, there's, there's people that do it all their lives. You know? Now they yeah. do, but in the history of man until the last couple of hundred years or the last hundred years. Well, we've been based, if you look at the work of Weston A. Price, who was probably the, the greatest researcher of this, and yeah. he went back a hundred years ago. Um, and he studied native cultures all around, and indigenous cultures all around the world. He noticed none living today <laughs> were had a vegan or a vegetarian approach. Mm. They all they they covered it or, or respected vitamin K two and vitamin A, and that in its in its most pure form comes from the from the offal of an animal. So we. We got here because we're hunters and mm. we're gatherers. And we hunting is a lot more nutritious for us than the gathering aspect of it, yeah. you know, from my experience. And and if people are vegetarian and vegan and are listening to this, then, you know, I don't want to change. I'm not here to change anybody's mind and I respect everyone's journey Same. because we've all been on it. You know, I was doing it 20 years ago. But what's interesting is a lot of my mentors – we're also vegan, vegetarian, because we all want to do good for the planet. We want to believe in something that we're doing that's going to benefit us mm. and benefit all the creatures of the world. You know, we, we, we're human beings. That's, again, unconditional love. Sure. It goes for ourselves and everything. Yeah. That's, that's our state, right? But isn't so, that a naivety, though, Pete? To believe just because you're a vegetarian, you're doing the best for all creatures. You yeah. might be doing the best for the big ones, but what about the little ones? Well, there's a great book and a, a person I've interviewed called Leah Keith, who was a 30-year vegan and a, a vegan activist. So she went out there and really riled people up to say, you know, we should be vegan. And she, then she wrote a book. She got sick. The, so the she wrote a book myth. called The Vegetarian well, Myth. And I recommend people read that book if they if they want to further their education it's about this. It's a good this. read, yeah. You know? Halfway through, it's amazing. So, but the good thing about the vegan and vegetarian movement is the people doing it because they they want to identify with something. They want to, a lot of them want to join the tribe yeah. and be a part of something because we, we, I think generalizing, we feel lost mm. as individuated selves especially yeah. if we don't have that self-love. So when we can attach ourselves to a belief system yeah. that seems to be rosy for everything yeah. and we become fixated on that, and I'm the first, you know, I've been following a paleo approach for eight years. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, if tomorrow I got sick, I would look for different avenues. Mm. I'd be the first one to go, fuck, this didn't work for me. What else is there? Yeah. But at the moment, for the last eight years, Every year I feel stronger and I feel younger each and every year that I've been doing this. Yeah. I don't think I'm at my peak and I'm 45. So going back to these. But on that peak, can I ask, have you done tests over that eight years? Uh -huh. Like your biomarkers and things like, and they're getting better? Brilliant. Yeah. Heaps getting better by the year. And that's the real magic source. Like we can talk about I feel great, blah, 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 but biomarkers and things, if you're measuring yeah. bloods and body I, composition. I'm going to throw something in there in a sec about that. Okay. About the, the nutritional aspect because I just want to finish off on, on the vegan side of things because I, I'm excited about it because if I look at how people have – come to adopt a paleo keto carnivore mm -hmm. slash low carbohydrate healthy approach and i don't like the labels even though yeah. they fit um a lot of them had gone down the vegan path so if we've got this groundswell of vegan and vegetarian activism at the moment for the potential of creating a better environment better world better health yeah. and then that 
doesn't work for these individuals. And we're seeing it in on the vegan pages and the carnivore pages at the moment. People are going, you know what? I'm actually starting to put meat back into my diet and this is what's happening. Or I'm going full carnivore, full ketogenic and my mental issues, my depression, my anxiety, my bipolar, my I'm getting off my medications, my mm. blood markers, my autoimmune disease, my cancer, my, my type 2 diabetes are normalizing. They're going into remission. Mm. You know, that can never be underestimated. So even though there might be some pain at the moment with this, I see that it's a, it's an opportunity for growth, yeah. And I'm I'm super excited. Like I'm very optimistic yeah, about I'll this be movement. Interested. I'll be I'll be super interested because I do. I get exactly what you're saying. That for it's 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 a pathway to improvement. And for some, the you know, a bit like when if you're a party guy and you partied and drank and took drugs and did all that stuff, that sometimes you got to get off everything for a while. Well, I'm grateful for that. Exp- I'm yeah. grateful for being a vegan for many years and identifying with that yeah. until I realised that it wasn't for me. Mm. You know, it can work for some people. They can survive on this. Some can even thrive on a plant-based diet. You know, I don't but- see many, man. Like well, there's a couple like uh, that Rich Roll, you know, ultra marathon, and I see him, but there's a few of those guys that were behind that What the Health documentary, that Dr. Michael Gerber. Mm that has nutritionalfacts.org is his website. And he is a full-blown animal activist and vegan activist. He's way younger than you, which makes him by default even more younger than me. He looks about 20 years older than the both of mm. us. And I go, the proof's in the pudding sometimes. Buddy, this isn't working for you, man. And what's what's fascinating about this journey that I've just been on is, so the documentary I've just been filming is on cannabis. And a lot of my mentors and the people that I, I admire and respect and interview and take on their knowledge, they're saying the combination of basically a, a ketogenic, and ketogenic means using fat for fuel. Yeah, and, good and quality cyclical. Fats, yeah. You know, you don't have to be steadfast and I've never weighed a fucking carb in my life and I yeah. never will, you know. Back to I, intuition. I just eat good quality food. Yeah. <clears throat> and people can take that to the extreme, mm. you know. And... For instance, yesterday I had steak for breakfast. That was, and pretty much that was the one meal I ate. Yeah. You know, one big freaking piece of steak. Puff and fed. Yeah, of course. And <laughs> generally, and I do eat grain fed if I'm traveling and that's all that's available. I'm not going to starve myself, right? I will eat. Yeah. And it may not be exactly to do with my ethical, you know, philosophy. Mm. But I'm also understand that it might be 1% of my diet. It's like when I work on my kitchen rules, it's 1% to 2% of my yearly diet. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that have an issue with that. Yeah. And that's cool because they don't have to be me. Mm. I get to choose exactly what I do in my life, Yeah. who I work with, how I work, what I put in my mouth, Yeah. and I'm completely at peace with my choices. Because you get a lot of shit, Pete. Like you, 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 you <laughs> and, and I think, you're out there, and, and I think that's why I get a lot of shit. Yeah, you're because you're very honest. Um, but does it honestly? Is there ever a time where you go, "That's just grossly unfair," and it hits you? It used to a little bit until I stepped out of my ego, yeah, and realized it's got nothing to do with me. I'm, I, I now I see myself for whenever anybody whether it be the media, whether it be someone that comes onto my page and or somebody that emails me. And I get hate hate messages daily. Right. Really? But it might be 1% mm. of- That's Still a big percent the, for someone that I imagine gets a lot of mail. I get a lot of- Beautiful stuff. Fuck, mate. You, yeah. you know, tearful- heart-wrenching yeah. stuff daily. And that's not even why I do what I do. do yeah. I do what I do because I'm a student of life. Yeah, I want to learn and I believe I have a unique strength, which is I'm not the smartest guy in the world and I think that's my strength, mm. <laughs> you know, because I can – when I interview people like the last three weeks on the road, I said to every single neurologist, psychiatrist, psychologist, smart individuals, right, that have all these letters after them. Yeah, academically smart, yeah. And I love it because Mm. I say to them, I said, I'm making this film for my daughters. Mm. They're 12, they're 13 years old, 14 years old. 
and my mum's going to watch it, and she's she's nearing eighty. Yeah, I said, I know you're a scientist, but I want to know who you are, mm. why are you doing this work, and how can you say it in a way that I will feel what it is that you're trying to express. Mm. And from that, that is, I believe, one of my gifts because I can put myself in in the viewer or the audience's position that knows mm. fuck all, which I do. And I explain it in that in layman's terms. Not even me explain it. The, the it's not guessed. me. It's not I me. Saw, it's- I saw your interview, or not your interview, you were cooking with Dr. Terry Walls, whose story I've followed for years. I love it. You know, and for those that don't know, it had you know, she's a neurologist. She's a medical doctor of some description. She is, and she has MS. She has MS, yeah. crippling, debilitating MS, mm-hmm. and literally through a, whether you want to call it a paleo or an evolutionary diet, she is today a vibrantly healthy human being. Yeah, and yeah. I'm going to add to what I was going to say before. So, nutrition is vitally important. Mm. But I know so many people that are vibrantly healthy and eat shit. Yeah. Right? So what does that? Not m- many though. But what does that mean, right? And I know so many people that eat the best diet and still suffer disease, whether it be mental, spiritual, or physical. Yeah. So what does that mean? And I don't put all my be- all my chips into eating right. Mm. I don't put all my chips into into drinking the right beverages. Mm. I don't put it all into exposure to the sun and connection to nature. I, yeah. And I honestly believe our emotional well-being and our core belief systems and patterns that we have mm. is the true foundational being of health. Yeah. But I always say and that that is where plant medicines come in. Yeah. Because when you ingest a plant medicine whether it be cannabis, whether it be ayahuasca, whether it be a cactus, whether you are smoking toad medicine, for instance, mm. or psilocybin, yeah, all of these, they're called teacher plants or teacher um, uh, psychedelics. So a teacher, and this is interesting because this was the theme of my documentary with, about cannabis. What's a doco called? Don't know yet. Really? <laughs> okay, keep it so, posted. But all the doctors that I interviewed, I asked them what it meant to be a doctor. Mm. Define doctor for me and define health for me. But the definition of doctor was to teach. And what's happening in the cannabis space is because it hasn't come through the institutions yet, Mm. the information through the educational systems of universities, what's happening is the patients are teaching the doctors. Mm. The doctors are teaching new patients, but these this plant, for instance, and it's called a teacher plant like other psychedelics, it's called a teacher plant for a reason because it teaches you about yourself. Mm. And that can never be underestimated. And if you want to understand yourself, you have to look into the deepest, darkest shadows of your existence and how you believe mm. the world operates. And for that, it can be traumatic and challenging and a lot of people do not want to look under that veil yeah, of well, themselves. I think even meditation for some people is frightening for that exact reason. I don't want to understand what's in there. <laughs> and, and I tell you what, but... It ain't always pretty. No, it's not meant to be. No, Because I get it. you are learning about yourself. Mm. And so... If we have the capacity to open our hearts to understand and remember who we are, Mm. then healing takes place. Now, one of the easiest ways I see and has worked for me to to open that heart space is Mm. to nourish yourself with good food and good nutrition. It's the easiest fucking way. It really is the easiest way to start that that cultivation of self-love because there is no greater gift than to feed yourself 
and to your children. Yeah. And maybe if they're a handful, maybe you're not feeding them the right <laughs> food, right? You get Possibly. where I'm coming here? Because once you start feeding them the right food, and that is a a sign of love, of unconditional course. love. Yeah. It's like you wouldn't put Coca-Cola or, or soft drink into your dog's water bowl. Mm. But people do it to their kids. Yeah. You wouldn't let your dog eat McDonald's or your cat eat McDonald's. Mm. But we feed it to our kids. Now, is that love? Is that unconditional love? I certainly think it's pretty close to it, isn't it? How do you do it though, Pete? I don't have kids, man. I've got 11 nieces and nephews, so I'm not speaking from a a strong position of authority. But how do you- I don't think anyone can speak from a strong position of authority. Your kids are in Bondi, yeah? Yeah, they are. So they're living in the epicentre. Like albeit, it's a pretty healthy place, but there is a lot of fast everything in Bondi. Mm -hmm. How do you empower them to be their own little selves but also to make good decisions around food, hmm. drugs, the whole shooting match? Because they're moving into that, that, that age where those kinds of things are going to present themselves. Throughout their whole existence, I have had an open and honest conversation with them. Yeah, nice. They know exactly what I do in my life. Mm. What... Nothing is off limits. So we have very open conversations about everything. About taking pot, about taking mushrooms, about sex, the whole shooting match? Yeah, you're, you're, yeah. you're a parent. It's, um, if you're not going to teach them who is, you know, are you going to leave that in the hands of a, si- a system? Yeah. You know, and that is designed to create fear. And and to stifle creativity and to stifle people to have their own thoughts that may challenge mainstream dogma or positions. Mm. You know, I one thing I've learned about being a parent, and and, and it's an ongoing uh, school for me, mm-hmm. and it will be for the rest of my my life, no doubt. Yeah is the best possible thing we can do is get out of the way of our children yeah. and let them be their authentic self. Mm. Encourage their their passions, whatever they may be. Find, let just you I don't even want to use the word guide, but we need to shelter, we need to feed nutritious food, I believe. Yeah. We need to provide an a space of open and honest communication. Yeah. We don't want to lie to our children. Mm-hmm. You know? They've even, got to feel a belonging. They've got to feel love. They've got to have that whole cabal they thing. They have to feel that they're, yeah. they're important, that they matter. Yeah. You know, and our society deems that you matter if you win or get a great grade or beat mm. someone in a sporting event. Or a skinny or... Whatever it may be, yeah. you know, and it's, I think it's going to be an ongoing journey of discovery for me, you mm. know, and I, I, I sometimes I get through the day and go, fuck, I could have done, maybe I could have done that better. But it, it's, it's, again, it, it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to grow yeah. in that space. And the last thing we want to do is create mini me's. Mm. Yeah, no, most definitely. <laughs> but that is the problem with a lot of people, isn't it? They even call their kids after themselves. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, how do you balance a people, you know, obviously Nick and Astrid, like how do you balance with two mums effectively? Is it a challenge or it's just a beautiful thing? Well, again, everybody is their authentic self. Mm. And I think, again, bringing labels into that is could be not the right approach, you yeah. know. But don't they both play a maternal role? Uh, well, Nick is my wife and yeah. uh, she, even herself, says that she's like a big sister to these girls. Yeah, she's nice. their friend. She's She loves them unconditionally. Yeah. In And doesn't feel that she has to play that maternal role? No, she's not. She's Happy days. She's it's like happy. being an uncle, man. Yeah. Just the good shit. Yeah. yeah. She, the, the girls have their mum. Yeah. 
and they have me as their dad. And, uh, you know, some would say that they chose this existence. Two crazy cats. You know, and, and what's super exciting is mm. I cannot wait to see where both of these unique, individual, authentic selves what they do in their life, you know, mm. and I have no expectations, I have no desires that they do good or bad or whatever. It's just, I, as I said at the start, I'm so excited to just sit back, play this game of life yeah. and watch it unfold, mm. you know, and if they have children one day, I'll be a grandpa, and if they don't, I won't, it you know. Matter. And w the relationship that we all have, whether it's uh, – you know, we just had a holiday together, the whole family. Mm. So we went skiing in Japan. So I had my wife, Nick, with the kids with me for a week. And then my ex-partner, the mother of the girls, came over with her boyfriend or partner. Um, and they had the second week in Japan with the kids. So the kids got two weeks of skiing Amazing. powder in Japan. In the Seko? Uh, Hakaba. Oh, beautiful. But we had a crossover of three days in between where we're all together in the same house and we, we all get along because the intention is there yeah. to be cool. Yeah. You know, and to be a support for each other Yeah. in this game of life. And it's, you know, if we all have that intention to love unconditionally and mm. connect with each other and that it's not a competition, mm. then your game and competition, I think people, I, maybe it's the wrong word, but I see it as a fun game mm. to play. And but even business should sometimes, be like that. Sometimes the dice <laughs> doesn't rolls get the you wrong way. Yeah. Well, I won't say it rolls the wrong way because even the challenges are huge opportunities for growth. Yeah. And embrace the suck. Just when you think you've got it worked out. Yeah, you never have it you know, worked it's out. Come, something will come along and go, you ready? Yeah. You want to go to the next level? Or actually we might uh, drop you back down that, that snake on the snake's ladder board. Yeah. Sometimes you feel like you've, you've rolled the dice and you go up a couple of levels and other times you might go back to the start yeah. and go, okay, all right, everything's cool. What does this mean? For the people that... I suppose whether it's call it where they're at evolutionary or whether they're cynical, whether they want to call it woo woo, what's your advice in terms of for people that, because I do genuinely believe that everyone wants to do good, that sometimes through insecurity or ego, whatever it happens, they make decisions that aren't good for the collective. But what do you think of the, the quickest routes for people that are struggling to feel in contact with nature, to feel in contact with themselves. Is it meditation? Is it the psychedelics? Is it just choosing the right career? Is it none of those things? Like, have you got a prescription that you reckon would help <laughs> as a general rule, Pete, most people? I take the, the label of good or bad out of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy with that, man. It's just very hard so, to describe things without labels of some description. Exactly. Yeah. So if we if we remove good or bad or right or wrong, mm -hmm. and we just be, yeah, and we we feel, we know intuitively what the right path is for us. Mm, in every, I'm not sure everyone does. But in yeah. e in yeah. every choice we make, yeah. And you have to think about every, how many choices we make in a day. Mm, thousands. And if yeah. we were, if we were aware and conscious of each and every one of those choices, magic will happen mm. based on how we feel about those choices and what we're willing to discover about ourselves. I'm in agreement there. So. How do you get to that space where people are making that conscious choice? Some people use meditation. Yeah. I'm not going to say that's the answer for everybody. Helps. I don't think there's any downside to it. Some people like to use exercise as a modality. Yeah. That can cause more problems and good for some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's another form of addiction. Some, Yeah. It yeah. can be. Some people like to um, change their diet. Yeah. That's a good thing. Get off the Maccas. <laughs> Get be. off the sugar. You know, I, 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 I've just written a book called Heal, which comes out in June this year or July. Heal. 
Heal, H E A L. Nice. And in that, I've I've written 101 ways in which to possibly improve your health. Possibly, I like that caveat, man. In this modern world, yeah. And basically, it's a return to nature and return to self. Okay, well, people can read that book. So, That's the answer my question. No, and in that, I talk about diet. I talk about movement. I talk about self-love. I talk about connection. Mm. I talk about belief systems. I talk yeah. about all all the things we've spoken about today and more. Mm. Creativity. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly believe our one purpose on this planet in this existence is to express ourselves creatively. Yeah, I what it, disagree. However that feels, mm. in whatever mutations or manifestations or, or ways that is for you, and it doesn't have to be one. You yeah. don't need to be a chef. You don't need to be an artist. You don't need to be a singer. You don't need to be any of these things. It can be a million things that you mm. want to express and learn and remember and share and have in this experience. Yeah. So find a way that you want to express yourself that feels meaningful for you. Mm. And that expression could be cooking a piece of steak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And I'm very careful not to give prescriptions. Yeah. What about though, and I hate the phrase of biohacking. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've experimented with that you're, you're knowledgeable on that you think have legitimate validity? <laughs> like you talked about your bed before. Yeah. Do you believe in grounding your bed? Yeah. And we, I go through that in the book and, and this may get into an area where it becomes... I won't say woo, but I'll need more time to explain why each of these may work. Yeah, and maybe I don't want a deep explanation, Pete, but I think just enough of the things that you think have got real legs, like nootropics as an example, you know, the whole vitamin for the brain that I have read enough to be dangerous, I've tried enough to be skeptical i'd be super interested as an example whether you have a view on that um it would depend on the individual yeah. i think all of this is dependent on the individual mm. so for instance ice bath cryotherapy yeah cold water immersion yeah there's some Maybe big science behind that you know i love it yeah but ice baths or the actual cryo chamber all of it yeah yeah you know, but Ultimately, I just love being in the ocean. Mm. If it's cold, get me in there. Yeah, that to me at sunrise is invigorating. And that, if that's the one thing that I do, yeah, as my form of self love for that day, apart from the other things we've discussed, whether it's communication and looking at someone in the eye and actually yeah. seeing yourself in them, and yeah. vice versa. Mm. Um then that's fantastic. But if I don't get to do it out of a daytime, I also don't beat myself up. Mm. How do you replace it on the road, that ocean thing? Is it, is it meditation typically or is it just a bit of movement? It it can be anything, you know. And, and again, I'm not rigid or, or structured in any of my approaches. So biohacking, for anyone that doesn't understand that, it's a it's a method to or different modalities that we may employ to hack our system or our bodies or our our, our mental, spiritual, and physical um, reality to get it to a point of optimum. Uh, functionality mm. and even that just sounds crazy with me saying it you know there's mm. there's experts in this and i've interviewed a lots of them and they use different tools it could be breath work it could mm. be meditation it could be taking a nootropic it could be taking a plant medicine yeah. it could be a macro dose which is a full dose a heroic dose where you dissolve your identity and experience yourself as god i like the hero dose without you experiencing it. So yeah. there's no identity in there. Mm. Or it could be a micro dose, which just helps to 
spark creative and, and new neuroplasticity in your brain. Yeah. You know, as a supplemental dose, like some people take magnesium or probiotics. Mm. That could work great for some people. Um, it could be red light therapy. That Infrared. Infrared yeah. sauna, yeah. you know. So at home, I have an infrared sauna. I have red light therapy. I have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Mm. I have a ozone machine. I have a, a nano V, which is a different cellular water machine that I use. I have a chi machine. I use PE, PEMF um, mats and coils, which is pulsed electronic magnetic frequencies. Under your bed? On my bed and, and also in different um, positions on my body. Mm. So these are different aspects and different ways that from different people that I've interviewed say that it can improve your chances of being on this planet to watch this show unfold. For a longer period of time a longer, in a better state. For a longer period of time to keep your brain intact. Yeah. I've had three heavy brain injuries over my time, which is why I'm fascinated about- Like CTE stuff or- I've had a fractured skull when I was 14 and nearly died from being run over by a surfboard, 50 stitches and other traumatic head injuries. So for me, my goal is how do I ensure that my brain can stay fully functioning for as long as possible? Mm. Because we're seeing this epidemic of Alzheimer's dementia, which- um, one of the guests that I interviewed on my own podcast, uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. Yeah, no, I know Dale well. And he believes, and, and last two weeks ago, I was interviewing neurologist uh, Dr. Um, David Perlmutter as well. Grain and they brain. And grain brain. Yeah. And they both believe that dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, brain degeneration is 100% completely preventable mm. and reversible in a lot of instances, maybe 90% reversible, but it re it involves a multifaceted approach from, it, from yeah. nutrition to all of these things that we're Sleep speaking about, self-love. Yeah. You know. It's interesting, Pete, because my mum my mom and dad both medical doctors. My mum died of Alzheimer's in 2014 after a 10-year battle. And my dad started showing signs of it. And I, because I've read a lot of stuff after mum died, you know, Dr. Dale Bredesen and Pill Murder, et cetera. And, and like you, I believe that a lot of it is our own doing. And I tried to encourage my dad, who, you know, he was a pharmacist, then a GP, then an, an anaesthetist, and then a palliative care doctor, like a, a seriously smart guy. He could not for love or money get his head around that anything other than fate and God had made a decision. And so at 79 years of age, he's just sitting there and slowly fading away, you know, when there's this amazing science out there and there is evidence that not only can we prevent it, but we can reverse it. And, and that's where I think the conversations and the books and stuff that you're doing start to have, and I know it's not your mission, but they start to have a massively positive impact on people. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I'm doing this for myself. Mm, I get it, man. That's that's my self-love. Yeah. And maybe some of these techniques in five years' time will be deemed maybe dangerous mm. or maybe ineffective. Highly unlikely. But I'm happy to to roll the dice on that. Yeah. You know, if there's an opportunity, and I'm not obsessive about that, it might seem crazy what I've got in my yeah, house, an right? Yeah, experimenter, yeah. But I see that as I travel so much mm. and I'm in planes. It's a very unnatural thing that I do to myself with mm. the different time zones. You know, it's it's so unnatural. It's it's It defies being human what we actually do. Sure. And I live in that reality. And part of that is how do I minimize those risks that I'm doing to myself in the, in, in the grand scheme of things to enable myself, hopefully, you know, with a goal to be fully functioning for as long as possible. I mean, yeah. my, my, my one goal is to be surfing when I'm 100. Yeah. You know, I've made that. I'm coming with you, man. Commitment. Yeah. And who knows what's in store? I, I don't know, you know. An accident might happen. Mm. You know, I might be taken out by somebody, you know, for saying, speaking the truth. I don't know. Yeah. I feel protected. Um, I understand. But it's 
again, it's a, it's a, it's a fun game. And, mm. you know, it, to go along with fate and God and, and religion that you have no control over it, I would say that's how some people think and that's cool. Mm. You know, but I, I can put my hand on my heart and tell you my own experience of this reality mm. is we create our own reality. Mm. We can manifest everything that we want in our life or need, you know, and that might come as a challenge for a lot of people to understand. Yeah. But when you, when you become conscious of these wonderful opportunities for growth that present themselves to you mm. and they they present themselves to you on a daily basis. Yeah, they do. I fucking yeah, do, mate. Look at this. I get to talk to you. you know, that's a gift. And even just the last three weeks on this tour. Where have you been? What country the last three weeks? Canada and all over the USA. Oh, of course, with and, the cannabis. And, yeah. And here's the crazy thing. I only decided to do a film on cannabis a month before I booked was over there. What drove the decision? It was, I had this... Epiphany? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had this intuition that said, Pete, you need to do this and you need to do this now. Mm -hmm. You need to make a film on cannabis. And I was flying over to Canada. I knew I was going to be away from my family for three weeks. And self-doubt creeped in. What the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. I'm on the plane flying for 14 hours and another three-hour flight, knowing that I'm not going to see my children for the next three weeks, missing out on these opportunities of of watching them grow and being a part of their life and also with my wife. You know, what is this? Mm. And one thing that I've learned through the use of plant medicines and other things is trust, surrender, accept. Mm. I was like, no, you are here. And when I did my first interview on the first day, within 10 minutes, I knew that I was meant to be right there doing that mm. at exactly that particular point in time. I just knew it. There was just a knowing. And the next three weeks unfolded in in such a way that there were so many random, I don't use the word random, but... Yeah. Things that, that popped up from just random occurrences every single day that reaffirmed that this was exactly... Maybe they weren't so random. Things. Well, they're not. Yeah. You know, you manifest these mm. things. But we, we have the capacity to do that in all aspects of our life. Mm. And generally when it's, it's the... When we're fearful of, of that, when we step into that unknown, that's when the growth happens. Mm, I believe, for sure. You know, I, I was listening to this podcast today with this guy called Paul Check, and he's asked me to be on his podcast, and I was listening to my friend, the director, speak, and their conversation was different from this but similar to this but on a very deep esoterical level. Yeah. And I said to my wife, I said, fuck, he's asked me to come on in his, as his guest. I said, I'm, I'm f fucking scared to do, you know, to be in the presence of somebody like that. That's that goes so deep. That's so well read, that's so intelligent, that yeah. has a life of experience of mm. he works with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He's had hundreds of different plant medicine journeys himself. Yeah. And he wants to interview me. You know, and my radar goes, oh, my self-doubt. Like, oh. <laughs> Are you going to do it? Fuck yeah. Yeah, of course. Because. That's where it, the magic happens. It, I'm fearful of that in mm. one aspect. Yeah. You're not that fearful, really. Like, you know, you know that stuff. Like, But then I'm like, trust, there's a reason yeah. that this is presenting itself. Don't be a pussy, Pete. You'll be fine. Yeah. So. Can I ask quickly, and I'm conscious of time, mate, the evidence that's coming out in Canada and the US with cannabis, mm -hmm. is it largely positive uh -huh. in so far as whatever metric we're using, car accidents, deaths, violence? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a good story. This plant wants to be... It's coming. 
it wants to work with us mm. in, a, in a huge way. And I still got a big stigma, though. Looking at it on this journey that I've had so far, and I've got another 30 or so interviews to do in the next three weeks in Australia politicians, mm. uh, doctors, patients, Yeah, is that it's a powerful tool. And again, I won't throw all my eggs into or chips into onto that to mm. say it's the be all and end all. But I think it's another tool for humanity to reconnect back to nature. And I think it's making itself known. And the interesting thing about cannabis, for instance, is it, is it works physically on our endocannabinoid system, system yeah. which we all have, yeah. every mammal has. So it works physically, it works emotionally, and it works spiritually. Mm. So for something that, and, and we haven't even touched into what it can do for the planet as far as fuel, clothing, yeah. textiles, building mm. materials. I mean, 100 years ago, it was in every doctor's prescription box mm. in America. Yeah. It was part of their pharmacology. Mm. So I have a feeling and an understanding and a knowing that these, this is a powerful tool that wants to be used by us in a way that I, and I mean, this might sound very, very, very woo-woo, but I believe it's going to be one of the tools that will help us reconnect back to nature. And, you know, I don't actually use it as, I, I use it very sparingly, respectfully, I should say. You know, I, I smoke back in the day marijuana every day of my apprenticeship, basically. Mm. You know, and I did it in a way that had no intention, yeah, no respect or reverence for for the plant and the mm. the capacity. And not saying that everybody has to do it, you know, it. But it, it can help a lot of people. But again, I won't say that everybody should use it. Mm. There has to be a deep understanding or respect for these tools that we have, you know. It's like anything. We, it's, it comes down to the dosage. It comes down to where people are at their on their journey. Mm. You know, some people probably never have to have it in their lives. Yeah. Some people it may benefit for them to reconnect with themselves mm. because it is a teacher. Yeah. And it'll show you parts of you that uh, maybe you don't want to see, but I, need to see. <laughs> yeah, but I just I do. I think anything that gets humanity out of its cerebral state and into whether it's heart or whatever it happens to be to your point if it's done in in intelligent and intended ways can only have good benefits well let's put it this way i wouldn't see a need for the plant if we were in a state of unconditional love mm. trust and acceptance yeah i don't believe we would need that or any of the medicines that are out there because we would be vibrating and operating in perfect health and harmony. Mm. But maybe there's always progress, always improvement. <laughs> well, that's a belief. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that that pursuit of of improving, that's a belief, you yeah. know, I, I, which I fall into the trap, you know. I think all we need to do is be mm. and what that is for me is is completely different for you mm. and how to get back to that sense of being and and loving mm. you know it's a, it's it's an ongoing journey it is it is which i love you're a fascinating human pete thanks for coming on man thank you brother